1942. World War II is at a crisis point in the great land battles of Asia, Africa, even Europe itself. If the Nazi war machine is to be stopped and crushed, America must supply the Allies' war effort. Men, equipment, the weapons of war, millions of tons of weapons, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. They must be transported across one of the most treacherous and storm-ridden oceans of the world, the Atlantic. Sailors call it the Black Pit, the Devil's Gorge, an abyss. But there is another formidable obstacle. The sea is alive with a new kind of warfare. The Atlantic is the domain of the German U-boat fleet known as the Wolfpack. The Second World War at sea started practically uh, at the same level as uh, the First World War in 1914. The countermeasures uh, against U-boat uh, attacks were practically nil, and uh, you uh, have the records to show the sinkings achieved by German submarines. First, British shipping is the prey. World War II may hang in the balance. Then the U-boats come to the east coast of America. The Germans never had more than 12 submarines on the station. Uh, and this was about 600 men men of those submarines. Yet, in that six months period, they sank two and a half million tons of shipping right along our coast. You could see the ship burning off the, from the beaches. Somewhere in the Mediterranean, 1917. The past crosses the future as another modern weapon makes its appearance. Called the submersible in the language of arms, it's the modern submarine, and the Germans have pioneered it into operations. The tactics of naval warfare are primitive. Heave to the enemy, remove the crew, send it to the bottom with explosives, or to simply destroy it from the surface with deck guns and the primal torpedo. But with these tactics, the Germans have, for a while, made the Mediterranean a German lake, and they are nearly successful in blockading the British Isles. Twenty years later, Germany is again at war. Karl Dönitz, a World War I submariner, has developed a plan to use the submarine with deadly precision. To move individual killer subs towards a common point and strike above and below water as a wolf pack. The weapon, soon to be mass-produced on the captured coast of France, the Type 7C, the classic U-boat. Powered by a 3,000 horsepower engine with a cruising speed of 17 knots on the surface, the Type 7C has a nautical range of 9,000 miles to the Panama Canal and back. Almost 200 feet long, each boat is armed with a deck gun and carries 14 torpedoes that can be launched from four tubes in the bow. Each U boat costs a million and a half Reichmarks, but the sinking of one medium sized freighter of 6,000 tons pays the cost. Fifty men will live inside each weapon. They are a new kind of naval fighter for a new kind of naval warfare, trained with iron discipline, volunteers. During the war, over 30,000 Germans will go down to the sea to live inside this weapon. Morale is critical, the margin for error deadly. 
The men of the Wolf Pack will go to sea as one of the most formidable elite groups of the war. Restricted by treaty, Germany begins the war with only a few completed subs. Dönitz is close to his men, personally directing the operations in the Atlantic and South Atlantic. For Dönitz and the young commanders of those first boats, it's a great adventure. They'll be testing the odds of the sea with a new weapon and strategy, a new game of death. Herbert Werner served for four years in the U-boat fleet, first as ensign, then as executive officer, and then, finally, as captain. The first four years uh, saw the submarine primarily on surface. A submarine was a surface vessel and dived only occasionally for trim dives and submerged attacks. Life on surface was bearable if you uh, could stand the rocking. It was always wet, moist. We used up the diesel oil in the bilges first in order to uh, extend our range of ac action. And the smell was with us for the entire trip. Food started rotting within a couple of weeks. We lived on canned food for six and eight weeks. We uh, had three shifts on board, three watches. We went on deck or onto the bridge every uh, 12 hours for four hours steadily. We went into the engines for four hours and then we slept or relaxed for four hours. So every 12 hours, we came back on a watch. The hunt is one-sided. By the fall of 1941, the U-boat has become the most successful weapon of the war and the most feared. Over three million tons of British shipping have been destroyed. American ships supplying the Allies on Lend-Lease are also part of the carnage. Dönitz, soon to be the commander of the entire German Navy, meets with Hitler. With Pearl Harbor, the course unalterable. Hitler allows Dönitz to unleash the wolf pack against the shores of America. sentries are playing an important role in helping Coast Guardsmen patrol America's thousands of miles of shoreline. Mounted and afoot, the Coast Guard keeps close watch over all beaches on the Atlantic and the Pacific. We were, we were simply unprepared for it. We, uh, the Navy's eyes were on the Pacific and the Japanese fleet. And uh, it sucked, has never been fully explained because we had two years before the attack on the East Coast to see what was happening in European waters. Uh, and it was uh, simply, uh, we were not prepared for it. We were not prepared for war on our own doorsteps. We have discharged spies off the coast of Long Island, but no submarine, no German U-boat ever landed anywhere at any co coast. In the winter of 1942, the Wolf Pack, now based in concrete bunkers along the north coast of France, menaces the seas. Refueled in the Atlantic by milk cows, directed by Dönitz through a radio network of shortwave and ultra longwave, there is little defense for convoys at sea off Labrador and Greenland. Even the shores of America seem unable to protect themselves. 
Once we reached the east coast of the United States, there was no countermeasure at all. And uh, we penetrated the Chesapeake Bay without any uh, problems, without uh, seeing one US Navy vessel. The wolf pack runs unchecked. American merchant ships are being sunk at an appalling rate. East Coast city lights are a backdrop for more and more kills. The elite submarine crews have become seasoned veterans of destruction. The wolf pack is the weapon Dönitz had envisioned in World War I. His gambling that he can stop the convoy link across the Atlantic before the industrial power of America is felt. The evidence shows that he is winning the gamble. The Germans apparently control the American coast. Each voyage brings back news of victory. Convoy SC-107, 15 ships to the bottom, 81,000 tons. November 1942, 117 ships, 700,000 deadweight tons sunk. The score for 1942, over 8 million tons of Allied shipping lost. Roosevelt and Churchill know this is the most critical moment of the war. But Allied technology and know-how begins to fight back. New hunter-killer groups of air and naval power are closing the gap off the Greenland and Labrador coasts. New convoy tactics are put into effect based on the destroyer, faster and more maneuverable than the sub and a sophisticated radar system more sensitive and compact than before. When the British came out with a radar built in uh, aircraft, we could not believe it. So we were not prepared for the air attacks at night out of the blue sky. The greatest accomplishment was the British breaking of the German machine codes. And from, uh, uh, it started in 41, then the Germans shifted their cipher, and they, we broke it again in uh, 43, and from then till the end of the war. We were reading the traffic between the uh, U-boat fleet and the high command headquarters. And that is one reason that the carrier, the hunter-killer groups were so successful. We knew where the Germans were. Another breakthrough is the invention of sonar, echoing the location of submerged submarines. Then came secret technology, Haftaf, the shortwave radio detector able to read the heart of the wolf pack, its radio network. The German high command never, ever knew of such a device, that it was possible to pinpoint a submarine within seconds and release countermeasures within a half hour. After uh, Grand Admiral Dernitz saw that we were organizing convoys along the east coast of the U.S. and that we were getting defensive measures in place and reacting. He pulled his U-boats out and he moved them back to the North Atlantic because there the issue had to be decided. We were shipping huge quantities of goods to Britain. The whole war depended on that. Dunitz was busy with other things and I attribute the decline of our submarine force to the fact that he was not really uh, attending to his business. That means tactical involvement in the Battle of the Atlantic, which is imperative for a commander-in-chief. And from there on, the submarine became the hunted. North Atlantic, March 1943. The ocean is an arena for the hunter and the hunted. Dönitz has almost a hundred U-boats poised to strike. The previous six months have been the best of all for the wolf packs. 
over 600,000 tons in March alone. Now it is time for the final conflict for the convoys and the men of the wolf packs. Retired United States Coast Guard Captain John M. Waters served in the Battle of the North Atlantic. The greatest convoy battle of all time was fought in the middle of March, and that was a combined convoy, uh, SC-122 and HX-229. Within a hundred miles either way, a hundred by hundred mile area, you had 80 merchant ships, 20 men of war, 44 submarines and innumerable liberators and Sunderlandsmen, and everybody was milling around in that small section of ocean with their guns and torpedoes ready, and it was a wild, fierce battle. battle lasted 10 weeks. Each side suffered tremendous losses in one of the worst winters in history. The, the, the weather was always with us. It was, it was this terrible North Atlantic weather. Any seaman who's been up there will know that. But probably uh, the worst moments were when you knew there was no help coming, you were going to fight it out as you were, and you had four or five ships burning at one time. The tide turns. The wolf pack is being decimated. Destroyers, now with the increased firepower of hedgehogs, volleyed forward and detonated by contact, and bigger, longer fused depth charges, are able to strike with incredible force. Was it devastating when you reach a certain depth, then you were somewhat below the depth charge detonations, which simply meant you were safe. In order to get there, it takes quite some time for a submarine to dive down to 700 feet. Most of the submarines were lost on their way down. They just could not reach the safe depths. But once you were there, you could ride out a depth charge uh, barrage for two days or more. But you never knew whether you will ever make it up to the surface again. By 1944, the Allies had perfected the technology and tactics of the hunt. With the continued success of Haftaf and the knowledge of the German naval code combined with increased air power, the North Atlantic was made safer for the convoys. The wolves were hunted down one by one. We have lost from the operational force that saw action 97% of the boats. 93% of the operational manpower force was killed, went down with the boats. As the end of the war approached, the wolves wandered aimlessly, now on their own. The hunter has become the hunted. Even as Dördits, now leader of the Reich, surrenders Germany, wolf pack subs surrender within sight of the east coast of America. For a moment, they almost turned the tide of World War II. Almost. Churchill said that the only thing that frightened me during the entire war was the U-boat menace. The Germans would have been well advised to place their entire emphasis on it. And uh, I think he's right, and someone who agrees with him, uh, agreed with him, was, was uh, Grand Admiral Dernitz. When I visited with uh, Dernitz at his home near Hamburg, uh, he said if I had had 300 U-boats, uh, uh, I would have won the war. And of course, when the war started, he only had 46. The 
last days of World War II, the defeat of the wolf pack is made clear. U-505 becomes the first enemy vessel captured and boarded by Americans on the high seas since the War of 1812. It's an ignominious end for Carl Dönitz's plan and U-boats like the 505. Today, U-505, a relic of another age of warfare, is displayed as part of the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. 45 years ago, 30,000 men went to the sea in what was little more than an iron coffin. Most of them went down in their boats. But for a moment in time, they showed how defenseless our shores can be. I walked along the beaches five years after the war uh, off Cape, near Cape Hatteras and stuck my foot in the uh, sand and six inches below the surface was the oil. And uh, the feeling was that uh, we should never let it happen again. What Hitler did not have in 1939, the 300 submarines with which he would have won the war, the Russians have today. The Russians have over 400 submarines many of them nuclear powered, several of them larger, faster and better than ours. America entered World War II. Nazi Germany had already spread its empire across most of continental Europe. Poland, Belgium, the Netherlands and France were now occupied territories. Hitler was jubilant and the Nazi juggernaut was pushing deeply into Russia as well. The land battle of Europe for now had been lost. But the US Army Air Forces had an idea how to bring the war back to Germany's doorstep. The plan involved the development of a fleet of heavy bombers to fly behind enemy lines. One of this plan's main proponents was Curtis LeMay. We felt that uh, we could win a war without defeating the enemy forces in the field, ground forces in the field, by depriving them of the means to wage war and the will to wage war. This, however, was not believed by the surface forces, the ground forces. They believed that the infantry was queen of battles and you could not win a war or defeat an enemy without occupying their territory. But slowly the plan went ahead and England's countryside began its transformation into a gigantic airfield. Brigadier General Ira C. Eker was the first to lead the newly formed U.S. 8th Air Force Bomber Command. And the plane that was the first and most used in the daring daylight bombing raids over occupied Europe was the B-17. Each plane would become known and remembered by the personality bestowed upon it by its crew. Men who worked as a team, each responsible for the success of their mission and the lives of the others, as they flew through a gauntlet of enemy flak and fighters to reach the heart of the German war machine. It was a new type of warfare in the new battlefront of World War II, the skies.
wasn't until the United States was pushed into the Second World War that mass production of the B-17 began. The plane was first designed in 1934, but during a peacetime economy, relatively few had been built. Now the industrial might of America was challenged. To meet the demands of the Army Air Forces in both Europe and the Pacific, aircraft factories operated 24 hours a day. Thousands of skilled and unskilled workers assembled the bombers. Their output was astonishing. In less than five years, 98,000 planes were built, 12,000 of which were B-17s. Even though the B-17 continued to be improved and went through some minor structural changes, the basic plane stayed the same. It was almost 75 feet long, a wingspan of just over 100 feet. Weighing up to 30 tons when fully loaded, it was powered by four 1,200 horsepower Wright Cyclone engines. And since it was designed for daylight raids, it had to have enough firepower to protect itself from the quicker and more agile enemy fighters. When a reporter saw B-17 for the first time bristling with its many defensive gun positions, he referred to it as a flying fortress. Each plane would carry a crew of ten, and as their planes were still rolling off the assembly lines, thousands of new airmen had to be rushed into training in camps all over the United States. I started out with uh, uh, pilots that came right out of the basic training at about 200 hours. I think there were two other people in the group besides myself that had ever flown a B-17. And we had three B-17s to train with. And we had three months to do the job before we went overseas. So consequently, uh, about uh, all the flying we got was uh, uh, teaching the pilots how to get a B-17 up and down without killing themselves. The gunners had supposedly been to a gunnery school, but they'd never shot a gun out of an airplane. The bombardiers and the navigators came in about two weeks before we went overseas. Bombardiers had never dropped a bomb in their life. They didn't have any airplanes in the Air Force, but a practice bombing. The average age of the, of the B-17 B pilot was 21. I was just barely 22, and my co-pilot was only 19. My ball turret gunner was 18. It was, uh, it was a young man's war. When I got overseas, uh, it was quite an experience. I came out of a very small town in South Texas, and I had never been any place. And to be over in England and flying over Europe with those uh, Nazis and those fighter planes flying around was kind of exciting at best. It wasn't until July of 1942 that the first B-17s were delivered to the U.S. 8th Air Force in England, in numbers smaller than originally planned. Operations began anyway, and it was up to the ground crews to keep as many of the planes flying as possible. They would work through the night if necessary to maintain and repair battle-weary planes. It was also their job to place the deadly payload on board. On the average, each plane carried between four and 8,000 pounds of ordnance in its bomb bay. As morning came, the flight crews would gather to be briefed on that day's mission. We were given uh, photos and target maps and so on. And some of the photos were of uh, photos that British tourists had taken before the war when uh, British intelligence had uh, just scoured the countryside to get pictures of anything that people had taken for target identification. Remember when you approach the town what your indicated altitude is going to be. Now as you approach the area you're going to run into rather heavy concentrations of flak. That flak has to be watched for. You've got to deal with it as you've been taught to deal with it. We were given what we called an E and E kit, escape and evasion kit, that we carried with us with uh, different expressions in the different languages. And every mission, we were issued a cloth packet that had money in it, depending on where we were flying and also had a silk map giving us routes to walk out if we bailed out. Once on the field, both the flight and ground crews made final preparations. The flight plan and strategies would be reviewed one last time by the pilot, 
co-pilot, navigator and bombardier. It was important for the gunners to try and coordinate their efforts as well. They had to make every round count. Each gun had only enough ammunition for one minute of total firing time. planes taxied out of the runways, it was always uncertain how many would return. On the first mission in August 1942, 12 planes flew 200 miles into France, and all returned safely. But now the enemy was waiting. Rarely did a combat group make it back to base intact. that each time they took to the air might be the time their luck would run out. You, you couldn't poss possibly survive and, and think about being shot down. It has to be put in the back of your mind as so that you don't really think that it's going to happen to you. Uh, and when planes went down, it goes back to self-survival and rather thee than me was the saying. As the fortresses crossed the English Channel and headed for Europe, they ascended into the unforgiving conditions of the substratosphere. Uh, we were uh, flying at 25 to 30,000 feet and sometimes the temperature would get as low as 50 to 60 degrees below zero. Uh, we wore flying suits that were heated and we wore oxygen masks all the time. Uh, if your oxygen mask uh, came off uh, within a minute you would be unconscious in three to five minutes you would die. Once over the European coastline, some light anti-aircraft fire might be encountered. But the main concern was to keep watch for the first appearance of German fighters. I think the Luftwaffe had an extensive uh, intelligence setup in England, able pretty well to put their finger on our operations. At the same time, they had uh, radar stationed all over the coastal areas in inland to determine uh, even if they knew where you were going, now they have to use radar to determine which route you're going to take to get there. They knew where we were going. The German Luftwaffe was one of the world's great air forces. But now, with the advent of American daylight bombing raids, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering demanded that all the fortresses must be destroyed. Messerschmitt 109s and Vokovov 190s raced from German occupied airfields to try to prevent as many of the American bombers from reaching their targets as possible. I called the crew and said, here they come at 12 o'clock, and we looked right at these guys coming right at us, and I felt like I'd like to curl up into my helmet right there. And they came at us front, back, sideways, high, low, and there's no place to run or hide when you're in the air. When you're on the ground, you can jump into a foxhole, or you can jump behind a tree. But when you're flying up there at 20,000 feet, there's no place to go but just keep going right straight ahead. The bombers, now in a tight formation, had the concentrated firepower to repel many of the attacking fighters. But in swarm after swarm, the Luftwaffe's interceptors were persistent in their assault, picking away at the bombers that were in the formation's most vulnerable positions. The lowest and most exposed were in what became known as the Purple Heart Corner. formations approached their target area, the attacking fighters pulled away, and the next line of enemy defense would be encountered. Clusters of heavy anti-aircraft guns protected all German military and industrial locations. The flak was the scariest part of the mission. You could shoot back at fighters, but the flak, uh, they would send up a box barrage of shells, 88 shells, and they would explode at certain altitudes and you sat there heading toward the target 
the bombardier would fly the plane on the IP straight into the target. You could take no evasive action, and you knew that you, you just prayed that you got through without getting hit by an enemy shell. Using the Norden bombsight attached to the plane's autopilot, the bombardier took control of the aircraft during the final approach to the target. Employing gyroscopes and an advanced computing system, the Norden bombsight provided a degree of precision far greater than any other. American bombardiers boasted that they could put a bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. By late 1942, it was decided that the best and most battle-experienced crew should be in the lead plane. And when its bombardier dropped his bombs, all others in the formation would follow, saturating the target below. At the Casablanca conference in January of 1943, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill agreed to continue the Allied bomber offensive. Germany's war industries were soon subjected to around-the-clock bombardment with American precision raids during the day and the British Royal Air Force's area bombing at night. Priority targets included ball-bearing factories, railway yards and the oil refineries that supplied the lifeblood to the German war machine. At the point that the bombs are dropped, your mission, of course, is only half over. Uh, the return flight, of course, is much more flexible than the one going in in that you can go any direction you want. Uh, our intelligence was pretty good, too. Uh, you could dodge the flak emplacements pretty good. But the enemy fighters were so mobile that you had to outguess them. If you could find a route back that uh, would kind of throw them off, catch them off guard, you might get out of their uh, fighter range where you wouldn't meet them coming back. If you guessed wrong and they guessed right, you're going to catch a lot of fighters coming back. So it was kind of, it was a guessing game, and whoever won had the best, best of it that day. Most of our losses, I think, occurred with uh, airplanes that were uh, hit by flak and couldn't keep up with the rest of the formation. And then, of course, the fighters swarmed all over them, and, and uh, their chances of surviving were practically nil. B-17 was a great combat aircraft, but. Uh, Many of the crews did not get home from their missions because they were so badly shot up. In my case, uh, I had to leave my aircraft at 19,000 feet. They both left engines on fire, and the other nine members of my crew never did make it to the Italian shore. And I wound up spending the rest of the war in a German prisoner war camp. I was shot down on my seventh mission, and uh, at that time, a 20 millimeter shell came through the side of the airplane, took out all the control cables, and put a big dent in my flak helmet, which I was wearing at the time. As you came down, it was preferable to get captured by the military because Hitler had put out some posters uh, called Luft Gangsters, and this portrayed this guy coming down in a parachute, and he was after him. So quite a number of airmen, when they came down, were killed by the civilian population. Back at the bases in England, the men on the ground waited for the formations to return from the battle over Europe. Some of the fortresses made it back virtually unscathed, but often many planes would never return. After a long mission, planes that had survived the enemy's guns simply ran out of gas before they could reach their airstrips. Sometimes the volatile weather over England would make it impossible for the pilots to find their landing field, resulting in many crash landings. Others, heavily damaged and partially inoperable, came limping back home. If the plane was beyond repair, it would be quickly cannibalized for spare parts. The 8th Air Force was facing a critical shortage of both planes and men. Well, when we returned from a mission, uh, like on the Schweinfurt mission, we took off with 26 planes and only 15 of us came back. 11 were shot down. My pilot, uh, my co-pilot, Daryl, had his own crew for the first mission and they were hit and they 
managed to land in the English Channel and were rescued by the British Air Speed Rescue Team. And they got back to the base the next day, uh, luckily for them. But it was pretty sad when you uh, start out with 12 original crews, and out of 12 original crews, only that's 120 men, only 37 of us finished our missions. So it was pretty rough in the early days of the war. By the second half of 1943, American losses had become staggering. Almost one third of the men flying in the heavy bombers failed to complete their quota of 25 missions. The toll that was taken contributed greatly to the total losses suffered by the US Army Air Forces by the end of the war in Europe. Their loss rate was statistically second only to that of the infantry. 18,000 men were wounded, 31,000 became prisoners of war, and 43,000 were killed or missing in action. Of the 12,000 B-17s that flew in operations around the world, 5,000 were lost in action. Another 2,500 shot up and battle-weary would manage to get its men back to their base, never to fly again. Operations out of England were temporarily suspended late in 1943, but it was realized that this was the terrible cost that would have to be paid for an ultimate victory. The winter of 1943-44 was another setback for the Allied air operations in Europe. The worst weather in ages kept most of the bombing missions grounded. It gave the German war industries a chance to rebuild and replenish its arsenal. But when the winter finally broke in February, the 8th, now joined by the 15th Air Force flying out of Foggia, Italy, launched the most effective bomber offensive yet. It would become known as the Big Week. Allied fighters now had drop tanks that enabled them to carry enough fuel to escort and protect the huge bomber formations from Luftwaffe assaults all the way to the target and back. Some bombers were still lost, but by the end of that week, the huge formations of bombers had finally begun to destroy the enemy's ability to wage war. The primary objective of the big week was the German aircraft industry. An estimated two million pounds of bombs destroyed half of all German aircraft plants. The Luftwaffe would never fully recover. It had already lost most of its trained pilots in combat, and from now on, it was reduced to a defensive air force and not a very effective one at that. By the time the Allies invaded the beaches of Normandy in June of 1944, strategic bombing missions had finally taken the form originally envisioned. As the ground forces made their push back across Europe, there were consistently thousand plane raids, escorted by an equal number of fighters flying into the very heart of Germany. Mission after mission, Bombs rained down on the last bastions of Nazi resistance as the war in Europe was being brought to its inevitably grim conclusion. And I remember we used to, to go into, uh, into Berlin over and over. And of course, all the, the uh, planes were knocked out of the air by then, all the German fighters and, and very little flak. And, and we were dropping the bombs you know, in that area. And we just destroyed, you know, city after city, Hamburg, Berlin and all. But it was only in the latter part of the war that, that you really kind of became conscious of what was happening. It was almost immediately after the war that the B-17 was retired from active duty. A new plane and a terrifying new technology had brought the war to an end in Japan. Most of the old bombers were used for scrap. Today, some make nostalgic appearances in air shows, while others, are silent reminders of all the brave men who took to the skies during World War II.